Hello and welcome to the MDE Office of Health and Nutrition Services session specifically for the Business Manager CPA Virtual Workshop offered through the Michigan School Business Officials. My name is Diane Golzinski. I'm the Director of the Office of Health and Nutrition Services and I'm very happy to be here with you today. So what have we been doing in the Office of Health and Nutrition Services since schools were closed starting March 16th of 2020? We have moved all of our child nutrition program monitoring, compliance, and technical assistance to virtual uh, way of doing business. We are conducting desk audits, working with many of you to assure that the program integrity is still in place as much as possible while also assuring that we are feeding children during this global pandemic. We've been learning to do virtual walkthroughs. We are using things like FaceTime, Zoom, Microsoft Teams to be able to connect and still see people face to face, while also still assuring that your questions are answered and all the technical assistance needs are met. We have been preparing for and providing online training for all of you on our website at michigan.gov slash school nutrition. You can find a link to the My Training Calendar, the Michigan Training Calendar, and that is very specific to the child nutrition programs. Those are trainings offered by ourselves, by our School Nutrition Association of Michigan, by our consortia and other organizations all to help food service staff and business managers like yourselves get the professional training hours that are required by the child nutrition programs. We've been using video conferencing a great deal. We have weekly town hall meetings. If you are not attending town hall meetings, please know that they happen on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. and we can get you signed up for the school nutrition news so that you can get the notice of those uh, meetings if you're interested. Town hall meetings are where we update everyone on the most up-to-date information we have from USDA, any new waivers, answer questions, and really an open forum to allow everyone to be able to feel like their needs are met during this incredibly difficult time. So when school was po po postponed, we immediately stopped all administrative reviews for the current school year and pulled all of our team off the road so that you all could just focus entirely on what you were doing to try to meet the needs of the kids. So what that means is that we actually had some reviews that were in pro progress and we were never able to complete. So those school meal analysts have been in contact with those school districts as to what those next steps are. We are certainly not going to ask any district to start over. We will never ask a district to um, cancel out any of the work that they had already done. We just simply will finish the review with the amount of information that we have. If we hadn't done an on-site visit, we would just note that in the review and move on. We've also held all findings reports and closeout letters since that time because we knew that you all were stressed and really struggling with trying to meet the needs of the kids and trying to figure out what education looks like in a virtual setting. So we now have permission to start sending those findings reports out. That will be both for the administrative review, which is the program side of child nutrition programs, as well as the resource management review, which is the financial side of child nutrition programs. So if you had a review this year, you will start to see those finding reports and um, um, corrective action plans coming through very soon. It's our goal to still close out all reviews by the end of the school year. If you have any questions, you are always welcome to contact your school nutrition programs analyst or myself and I will get you to the right people to get you answers. So we have been operating since March 16th under a provision of the Summer Food Service Program called Unanticipated School Closures. 
So if you are not currently participating in this, or if you haven't talked to your food service director lately, the unanticipated school closure, or USC for short, is really the way that we have been feeding kids during this time. The intent of the summer food service program and unanticipated school closure is really to provide free, nutritious meals to low-income children. Those children must be 18 and under unless they have a mental or physical disability of which they can then be 26 or under. So we can serve infants, we can serve one-year-olds or two-year-olds all the way up to age 26. The idea is that this is the program that operates when school is not in session. So when the governor canceled school and closed it down for three weeks, that's what we thought at 11 p.m. on Thursday night, March 12th, um, this was the program that kicked in. This was the program, is the same program that we offer on snow days where if school is closed unexpectedly, we can then offer meals under this program. It's important to remember that this is all federally funded. There are no state funds as a part of this program, although it is administered through MDE. The federal government and your federal taxes still pay myself, my team, and everybody working in these programs. It, the idea is that this program also is to supplement other programs and activities that are happening at the district. Although during this time of crisis, that requirement was um, set aside and waived so that no one had to do that. We have a number of waivers under this program. We'll talk about those in the next couple of slides. There is a link here to the Summer Food Service Program overview video if you would ever be interested in learning more about our program, you can always take a look at that. We do trademark this program in Michigan under the Meet Up and Eat Up name. So you may have seen that before, and that's how we get the information out to all of you or under the words traditional summer food service program. So in this program, as well as in unanticipated school closures, there is an application in Meg's Plus. There is a meal pattern that everyone is required to follow. In this particular program, it's not as difficult of a meal pattern as in the traditional national school lunch program, which is what your school district follows during the normal school year. This program always requires a congregate meal, except in the time of a global pandemic where social distancing is important. So we did have a waiver for non-congregate meals, which allows the meals to be consumed not on site. It allows the school, the meals to be taken away from the district and consumed somewhere else. Another waiver that we received was to allow parents to pick up the meals so that children don't have to be present. In a normal summer food service program, the children would have to be present and they would have to eat on site. Meal counting is still required under this program. Some districts are choosing to do that meal counting by free reduced paid status using a roster or a point of sale system. Some districts are choosing to use the traditional summer food service program count sheet, which is also used in a CEP or a community eligibility provision district where it's just simply counting the number of meals that are going out the door. That's really the easiest way to do it. And since under this program, it doesn't matter if a child getting a meal is actually a free child, a reduced priced child, or a paid child, we can just count the meals in that very simplified manner. Claims are still entered into the MIND system, and I'll be talking more about claims as we go through the presentation today. But that is where you would enter your number of meals served, and we can then reimburse you. Record keeping and monitoring of all the locations is still required as a part of the program, as is proper procurement of any meals or products that you'll be using in the program, staff training, and then of course, community outreach and communication. In this particular program, we populate a map of the state of Michigan, which allows families to be able to find the meals. You can find the map, at www.michigan.gov slash meetupeatup, www.michigan.gov 
slash meetup eatup. That's where you can find the map and that map shows locations that are open all over the state. That's where we really direct the media or parents or anyone else who's interested in finding a meal under this program that we direct them to that map because that's the most up-to-date way of being able to connect to a meal location. Training is required for both the traditional summer food service program and the unanticipated school closures summer food service program. All new sponsors, any new school districts who are interested in participating in the program and any new staff are required to be trained by the MDE training. Returning sponsors are required to attend an MDE training at, at least once every three years. Our training, as I said earlier, is now entirely online. And that is an active link on the slide that you can use to connect to that training. The Summer Food Service Program sponsors will need to register using the access code on the screen and at a minimum complete the planning and administering the SFSP 2020 course, which is also known as Michigan 100. As a sponsor, you are also required to provide at least one training for staff, and there are multiple trainings available, so you can use one of our trainings, or you can create one of your own, but you must create, you must provide at least one training for your staff. And it's really important, as in all the child nutrition programs, that all staff understand the program must comply with USDA regulations to receive reimbursement. So let's say hypothetically, your milk delivery doesn't arrive and you are required to provide milk as a part of the summer food service program. You must provide a protein, a fruit vegetable, a, a whole grain and a dairy. So the milk is a required component, but your milk delivery doesn't arrive. Every staff person working that day must understand that if they serve a meal that doesn't include milk, that meal is not reimbursable. I'll talk about waivers for that particular instance in a little bit, but the reality is everyone must understand that. If, a, if meals are served on a bus route and the bus driver is not recording the meals that are served, then none of those meals that have gone out the door are reimbursable and your program is on the hook for that financial cost. So it's really, really critical that every single staff person understands the program compliance with USDA regulations. Now, let's say you are a district that has a food service management company and you have delegated the responsibility to your food service management company to provide those meals. In that case, the district employee who oversees that contract with the food service management company is required to attend these trainings, is required to maintain the appropriate level of professional standards training hours, and is required to know those USDA regulations. There is no excuse to say, well, I didn't know, I didn't understand that, I expected the food service management company to know that, and so therefore it's their problem. Nope, it is still the ultimate responsibility of the sponsor, which is the school district. That's why a school district employee is still required to participate in the training and know and understand the regulations. It's also important that more than one person should know how to do the tasks that are necessary to get this done. I'm sure you all have been in a situation where you've lost an employee or an employee gets sick and they were the only one who knew how to use that task. In that situation, again, we still cannot reimburse the meals just because that person was not there or had not explained that task to someone else. So it's important as someone who oversees a program to know and understand those pieces and assure that there are always backups and that there is always a backup plan. It's important to recognize that while we are serving under the unanticipated school closure SFSP program right now, that program will end on June 30th of 2020. There is not an ability to continue under that program past June 30th. The USDA has made it very clear that we must move to the traditional summer food service program 
as of July 1st. The traditional summer food service program requires that every location where meals are served is over 50% free or reduced numbers or eligible by census track. Any site that does not meet that eligibility requirement is not able to serve meals under the traditional summer food service program starting July 1st. So again, this was a USDA decision. MDE has applied for a waiver to try to move past that and allow every sponsor who wants to serve meals after July 1st to be able to do so. But we won't know about that waiver's approval until closer to that date. So as of right now, unanticipated school closure SFSP meals end on June 30th of 2020 for every sponsor in the state. So for those who are interested or already planning to provide meals under the traditional summer food service program, it's important to know that the summer food service program application in MEGS Plus is due to be completed by June 3rd. The state agency staff, which is my staff, have 30 days to review those applications and return them for modifications or approve them. Any meals served before an application is approved are not eligible for reimbursement. So it's really important to get that application in as soon as possible and not to serve any meals for reimbursement until you get an approval. It's also important to recognize that every state agency person, so every person working for the state of Michigan right now, is required to have a layoff day every week. So now we're trying to do all of our work in just 32 hours a week, which means that our application approval is going to be delayed. We are all working as fast as we possibly can, but the sooner you can get that application in, the better chance there will be that we can actually get it approved prior to that July 1st start date. For anyone who's never participated in the Summer Food Service Program before, but may be interested in doing so, there is an eligibility page on our website, and that is an active link on the slide, where you can review if your sites may be eligible for the program. If you find that you have sites that are eligible, you can email us at mde-sfsp at michigan.gov and we will be able to give you access to the Summer Food Service Program MEGS Plus application. You have to still submit that application by June 3rd and then complete the training. Now, let's say you're watching this video and it's after June 3rd and you decide, yes, I really do want to have our school district participate in this program. Email us at that website and we will work with you. Just know that we still need 30 days to approve the application and you cannot serve meals until we get you an approved application. So please know that we will work with you, but there's not a lot we can do prior to getting that application approved. And then many people start asking, well, what will administrative reviews look like in the summer food service program? How will we know if we get a summer food service program administrative review? MD is required to continue to maintain program integrity. And as a part of that, we have to do reviews. So you can imagine that our reviews are going to simply look different this year because we will not be on site. We will not be driving to all these different locations to see how it's going we're going to need a lot of help from every summer food service sponsor in helping to make these reviews work. So if you are a brand new summer food service program sponsor that has never participated before, you will be getting an administrative review. We are required to review every single new sponsor. We typically have five to 10 new sponsors in a summer, and right now our number is about 130. So we're looking at 130 administrative reviews just for new sponsors as of today. We also have to do a certain percentage of the locations where meals are served in the summer food service program. 
So as of right now, we're looking at about 230 administrative reviews for other summer food service programs and all of their sites, all of their locations where they are serving meals. We also have to review all of those who were providing meals under the unanticipated school closure program. So about half is our target number that we have to provide a review to, which means we will have about 325 unanticipated school closure meals, that uh, school, unanticipated school closure programs that we will have to do a review of all of those meals served. So how in the world are we going to get all of that done, right? I didn't get to add staff. In fact, we have a hiring freeze at the state agency. And so we have pulled in staff from all areas, the child care area, the school nutrition area, even our school health and safety area, to try to help us meet this requirement for these number of reviews. We have been working hard on a monitoring plan to provide to all of you, and we will be getting that out as soon as it's ready. We will also be providing a guide for what a summer food service program review will look like in this type of virtual environment. It may mean taking a picture of food service, of the service, the delivery of the meals. It may mean scheduling a time for a FaceTime call or a Zoom meeting or some way of us being able to watch the service so that we can assure there is program integrity. If you are a program that will be getting a review, you will be notified by mid-June of that review. We will focus our reviews on your menu, your production records, your daily meal count sheets, and your monthly claims, as well as then some verification of meal distribution. We were planning on holding Q&A webinars. That was up until the point where USDA gave us extended waivers for the traditional summer food service program. So under the traditional summer food service program, we now can offer non-congregate meals, which means the meals can be taken off site. We also can have parents pick up meals. So because of that, because of those two waivers, we've decided to cancel those Q&A webinars and we will have three webinars for which each sponsor must choose one. So you must attend a training on either June 9th, June 11th, or June 17th. So depending on the day that you're watching this recording, you will determine probably which one of those that you attend but those are mandatory in order to provide meals in the traditional summer food service program this summer. All right, so please remember that meals can be provided under the unanticipated school closure program only until June 30th, 2020. That means if you are a sponsor that has locations that do not qualify for the summer food service program, they cannot serve meals after June 30th for which you will want reimbursement. If you want to continue serving meals and not ask for reimbursement because you have all kinds of money and can afford to do that, or a private funding source, absolutely, please feel free to go ahead. But any meals served after July 1 must be under the traditional summer food service program and must meet eligibility requirements. At this time, no one can provide meals through two programs at the same time. So come July 1, you can no longer provide unanticipated school closure meals. And once school starts in the fall, whatever school looks like for your district, whether it's online, whether it's a hybrid, or whether it's in person, it doesn't matter. Once school starts in the fall, the traditional summer food service program must end and the national school lunch program takes over once the school year starts. Because we cannot participate in two child nutrition programs at the same time. The traditional summer food service application deadline has been extended to June 3rd. And again, if you're watching this after June 3rd, please know to contact us and we will work with you if you have not yet filled out an application. 
Under unanticipated school closures, we were able to provide meals for seven days a week if that's what the sponsor wanted to do. We also have a waiver to do that in the traditional summer food service program. So at sites that qualify for the traditional summer food service program, it will be pretty seamless going from June 30th to July 1st and moving through the rest of the summer. The big difference is going to be at those locations that don't qualify for the traditional summer food service program. That's where service must stop. But traditional summer food can provide non-congregate meals, it can have parent pickup, and it can provide meals on weekends and holidays if that's what the sponsor wishes to do. Again, traditional summer food service must end and national school lunch and school breakfast programs must pick up once the school year starts in the fall, no matter what that school year looks like. And all sponsors are responsible to continue to monitor all summer food service program sites per the application agreement. So when you fill out an application and you submit it, you are agreeing to do all those monitoring of all of your sites. Let's say under unanticipated school closures, you are putting meals on buses and delivering them to families on your bus routes. Yes, that can continue under the traditional summer food service program. But there's an important caveat to that that everyone needs to understand. Under unanticipated school closures, we made the decision as a state agency to count the bus route as the site in your application to us. In the traditional summer food service program, we are not able to extend that to all sponsors. Instead, every single stop on a bus route must be an eligible stop and it must be entered as a separate site in the summer food service program application. So hypothetically if you had 15 bus routes and that's how you were getting meals out to your families, each bus route had 30 different stops for where they stopped and delivered meals to children then that would be 450 sites for which you are responsible to monitor, to collect um, service information, and to provide claim data to us in order to get reimbursed for those meals. So it is possible, nothing is stopping anyone from doing that. I just need to be sure that everyone fully understands the amount of work it will take in order to continue to do that. So for additional information for either the traditional summer food service program or the unanticipated school closure um, program, you, our website is michigan.gov slash SFSP for summer food service program. Our unanticipated school closure website is there. The USDA website is there, as well as policy memos that relate to what we're talking about at this time. Okay, so the next program I thought I would talk about is the Pandemic EBT program, or PEBT. This is a program that many people are very excited about. It came as a result of the Families First Coronavirus Act, which was signed into law March 18th or 19th, I believe, at the federal level. This program is to provide food benefits on a card to families to replace the meals that they, their children would have gotten at school. This is very specific to children who were receiving free or reduced price meals while at school. The benefit is about $5.70 per day per student for every day for which school was closed. So in the state of Michigan, that's two weeks in March, the entirety of April, the entirety of May, and we were able to count two weeks in June, since every district is different as to when their school year was ending, USDA allowed us to count two weeks in June. 
So what we did was combine payments for March and April, about six weeks worth of payments, and then May and June, about six weeks worth of payments for those two payments that will happen to those families. It's about $190 for March and April. It's $192 plus some change. Um, and then for May and June, it's about $180. But remember, that's per student. So $190 and you have three children, that's three times $190 just for May, March and April. Those benefits, once that card is pinned, those benefits expire after a year. So for families that were already on the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is also known as SNAP, uh, formerly known as food stamps, sometimes called, just simply called the Food Assistance Program, for any family who was already receiving those benefits, these benefits, these PEBT benefits, were just added to their bridge card. And those families started to see those benefits around mid-April. I think it's important to note that Michigan was the first state in the entire country to be approved to participate in this program. And we are the state that has given out the most benefits to date. I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. But those who were receiving SNAP before got the benefits on their bridge card. Those who were not receiving SNAP before, but still were getting free or reduced price meals while at school, had a Michigan PEBT card mailed to them through the US Postal Service. Those mailings started happening around the end of April and concluded around mid-May. Students who were at the same address were grouped together and the card was sent in the name of the oldest student at that address. So that's how cards were able to get to families. Once the families get the cards, if they want to participate and use these benefits, they needed to pin the card. And by pinning the card, they are agreeing to participate in the program. If a family didn't want to participate or doesn't want to participate, but they get a card in the mail, they can just simply cut the card up. Just don't pin it, that's the big thing. And the card is not transferable to other families. It's important to know that these are food benefits that can be spent much like SNAP um, or food stamps. They go to a grocery store and you use these for food, but these do not have the public charge rule uh, attached to them. So SNAP has a provision that says if you are an immigrant and do not have citizenship status and you participate in a public benefit program, then you cannot qualify for citizenship later, that public charge rule does not apply to PEBT benefits. PEBT benefits are just a part of the pandemic response. They are going to families and there is no attachment to citizenship or immigration status. So who are we reaching with this program? We've been working very hard in my office to try to think of all of the different groups of students that we would want to make sure we're able to get the card. So all public schools, public school academies, non-public schools and virtual and cyber programs, for those children who were eligible for free or reduced price meals at school and those student names were entered into the Michigan Student Data System, then we were able to grab that data from MSDS and send it over to the Department of Health and Human Services and they were able to get cards in the mail. If it was a non-public school that did not include that information in MSDS because they are not required to enter it, then we worked with them individually to have a separate MSDS collection for those children so that we could still get benefits to those families. Now, if you are a community eligibility provision school, then that means that all children were already eating for free, no matter what their family income status was. So that means that every single student in that district got a card. Um, every, single every single student got a card in those districts. 
We also worked with the Migrant Children Organization at MDE to get a file of the names and addresses of migrant children so that they could all get these benefits. For children experiencing homelessness, we were able to group their cards, send it to their homeless liaison, and the homeless liaisons agreed to get the cards out to those children, to locate and get those cards out to those children. The same for unaccompanied homeless youth. And children in foster care are automatically on the list for receiving benefits, so they would have gotten the benefits just like a child who was already on SNAP. We are also reaching the children in the early childhood programs that did enter information into the early childhood collection. So this was a snafu that we didn't really see coming. We didn't understand that until we dug into it. But Great Start, Readiness, Head Start, Early Head Start, um, Blended Classrooms, Early On, Title I Preschools, all of those, if the student data was entered into the early childhood collection, then we were able to grab those students' names and include that with the data that we shipped over to the Department of Health and Human Services. If a program had not entered that information in, just like with the non-public schools, we've been working with them individually to try to get the information uploaded so that we can still get benefits to those children. CEPI, our Center for Educational Performance and Information, has been a wonderful partner in opening up these non-public collections and the early childhood program collections, simply so that we can gather those students' names and information and get, that, get those benefits to them. So where are we at? What have we been able to accomplish with PEBT? As of today, we have issued over $242 million in PEBT benefits to families. This is about um, just shy of a million children. I know it looks like there's more than a million here on the slide, but a couple of those under the SNAP program were actually duplicative because both sets of payments have been issued. The payments for non-SNAP EBT, PEBT are still in process, but as of right now, 518,000 kids have received those benefits. So by the time we're done, nearly a million children will be receiving those benefits. Now, where are other states at? Good majority of the states haven't issued any benefits. Good majority of the states are still trying to figure out how to gather student data. If they didn't have a system similar to our MSDS, then every school district is going through and gathering names and addresses individually, sending them into the state, and the state is issuing cards based on those data files. So if you ever wanted to thank Michigan for having an MSDS, this would be a perfect reason as to why we would do that, because this allowed us to get up and running quickly, be able to serve those families quickly, get those benefits out so that those families could go to the grocery store and buy the food that they needed to help their family. A Couple of the other hiccups that we've run into as we've gotten through this. My staff at MDE and the staff at the Department of Health and Human Services, we cannot update student data. We can see it in some cases, but it's a read-only situation for us. Any changes must be done at the local level. Whoever within your district administration does your pupil accounting, those are the only people who can make those changes. So while I, my team and I probably get two, 300 emails or phone calls a day asking us to update student addresses, we don't have that ability. We must tell them that they have to reach out to their local school district administration to make it happen. Any updated addresses need to be reported in the student record maintenance for MSDS. Then we can pull that data and still get those benefits to those families. One of the benefits of being the first state to apply for and be approved for this program is that USDA actually approved us to be able to retroactive 
all payments for all families. So if records are being updated today, and we are able to pull that in the MSDS, MSDS poll in June, then families will get benefits going all the way back to March. After they approved our application and realized their mistake, they have not been approving that for other states. So that's a great thing for us. Another thing that we learned in MSDS is sometimes due to custody issues or some other random reason, two addresses were included in MSDS. There's an address line one and an address line two, and two different addresses were included. In that case, the electronic system kicked that student out and did not send them a card. So we have also been telling local districts, and it's really important to make sure that only one address is in MSDS for each student, because that's the only way for the system to know to pull that name and send it over to MDHHS. And then finally, the other thing is that if the birth date isn't accurate, the PEBT card goes to a family and the birth date is needed in order to pin the card. And so we have families calling us because they're, they know their child's birth date and they're entering that information, but the system is saying it's invalid. So again, we have to send them to the local school to make that change because we do not have access to change individual student data. So in light of this, we are asking every district to please continue to pull the direct certification reports and extend eligibility to siblings and others within the same household so that benefits can go to all children during this COVID-19 pandemic. You should also be collecting and processing free and reduced price meal applications. With the high amount of unemployment that we have, the high numbers of families who would be qualifying for free meals at school if we were still in school, those applications are really critical to be turned in and processed at this time. We've provided a template letter so that you can mail those applications out, or even better, if you have an online system, get that information out to your families. Having that information, having additional families will help you have additional sites that qualify for the traditional summer food service program. It may help you qualify for other benefits, it will also help those families have those benefits 30 days into the next school year. So lots of reasons why that's an important thing. And if you are involved in that at your district, I highly recommend that you continue to process those and enter that data into MSDS as soon as possible. Okay, a couple of other pieces of information that may be important to you as a part of your child nutrition programs. The child nutrition programs, the National School Lunch Program for 2020 had a June 30th date for the Local Wellness Policies Triennial Assessment. So once every three years, we must go in and do an assessment of the Local Wellness Policy. That first due date ever for that particular requirement was scheduled to be June 30th of 2020. If your district had already done that, then you should still complete the assessment and put that information aside for your next administrative review. If you did not get a chance to finish it because COVID-19 hit and schools were canceled, then we have a waiver that allows that due date to be extended to June 30th of 2021. However, if your district wants to participate in that new deadline, you must submit the waiver survey so that we can put you on the list of districts that have a June 2021 date and not hold you to the June 2020 date. So again, you don't have to turn anything into us. You keep that documentation at your level so that um, 
we can use it during an administrative review, but we will be holding you to one date or the other, depending on whether or not you submit that survey to us. Another important note is that if you have a food service management company contract or a vended meal contract, and the summer food service program was not included in your previous contract, then we have emergency procurement available to be able to allow that program to be added without any findings on an additional, on a future um, administrative review. So you can contact us at mde-fsmc-vended at michigan.gov and we will be able to work with you on that. For any procurements that are happening for the next school year, which is school year 2020 to 2021, we are working with those now, so there's no need to have a waiver or anything special. We can make that happen during this time. But if your previous contract didn't have it and you needed it, we will work with you under this waiver. So we continue to get a lot of questions about paying food service staff. I'm sure that that requirement as it came from the governor was um, stressful for everyone involved. And when we first started holding our town hall calls, we were told that paying staff that were not working was not allowable in the food service fund. Since that time, we have gotten additional clarification and additional information from USDA. And so the latest and greatest guidance that we have is paying staff that are working would be expected. Paying staff that are not working is a local decision. There is no requirement from MDE that you are paying staff that are not working. We do recommend that you, con you contact your district legal counsel so that they can consider some of the additional guidance that is listed here on the screen. Your staffing agreements, union contracts, if you have an FSMC or, or vended meal contract, um, the, your food service fund balance, of course, is going to be a consideration because you can't go negative in a nonprofit account. So all of those are considerations, but again, there's no requirement from MDE to pay staff that are not working. That is a local decision. All right, so some of you may be a little stressed in the last few days if you received the cash management overpayment notification. So the MDE cash management system, otherwise known as CMS, has an automatic um, automatic setting where if a negative payment happens in the system, then you are automatically notified of that negative payment. However, it doesn't have an automatic setting that says if a corresponding positive payment happens, you get notified, which is a real shame because that's exactly what happened in this case. The COVID-19 CARES Act required that MDE code all meal reimbursements under unanticipated school closures to a certain grant number. But we didn't get the grant number from the federal government until the end of April. So we had to take all payments that had been made up until that point and change the grant number. So a negative payment was made and then a corresponding positive payment was made to a net of zero. So there was no loss to your program. It really just changed the grant numbers that it was coded to on our end. So I apologize for that confusing notification. It's not something we can change in our cash management system at this time because CMS is going away. But I did want you to know that there was a corresponding positive payment so that there was no detriment to your food service fund. We've been getting lots of questions about coding and the chart of accounts under the unanticipated school closures. So that information is here on your screen. It, wherever possible, you should be using the Summer Food Service Program grant code, which is 858 in your food service fund, your nonprofit food service fund, which is also called Fund 25. 
it's also really important, if possible, on your end to track your expenses under this program because we don't know what's going to happen with future funding bills out of the federal government. Any future COVID-19 relief acts, if they were to ever address additional costs that you had under the unanticipated school closures, you would only be able to delineate that and figure that out if you were tracking them separately now. So if possible, track them and code them in a way that you can gather them quickly should additional funds become available. If you were delivering food in some way, the, the motor fuel, the vehicle maintenance, the driver wages or the contracted delivery charges, those function codes and object codes are all listed here on the screen for you. We've also been getting quite a few questions about food service donations. People who want to donate money to your food service program for whatever reason that is. And accepting those donations is certainly allowable. You would want to code them in your food service fund under the major class code of 192. Any expenditures can be coded as you normally would but we also rec recommend that you re continue to honor the intended purpose of the donation. So if the donation was to assist in providing meals during the unanticipated school closure, then you would do that. If the donation was to pay off any student accounts that were negative, then you would wanna make sure that you are doing that with that fund, because that's the proper thing to do with donations that come in. If you have any fiscal questions like that, our fiscal monitoring team is always available to you. You can email us at mde-fiscal at michigan.gov, or you can call us at 517-241-5380. All unanticipated school closure meals served during the health emergency were reimbursed, or have been and will be, reimbursed at the highest reimbursement rate available to us. So you see those rates on the screen. It's important when you look at your claim status report in the MIND system that you notice that the operating and the administrative portion of the rates are divided. So you will see the $3.76 for, for a lunch and supper separate from the 39 and a quarter cents for administration. All in total, it still totals the $4.15. So how have we been doing on our claims to date? We have 698 registered sponsors in our system providing meals at this time. So far, 650 March claims have been submitted. By the time you watch this recording, the March claims will all have been submitted because they must be done by the end of May. And 605 April claims have been submitted. <coughs> Excuse me. 32 million meals have been served in about six weeks. That's not a complete number because again, not all of our sponsors have reported to us yet. But that is quite a feat. We turned a program that was serving children in a cafeteria, following a very restrictive meal pattern, we turned it around on a dime. And in six weeks, we served over 32 million meals to kids. And that's absolutely incredible. Over $91 million has been reimbursed to school districts all over the state under this particular program. So, Every school district should be incredibly proud of all that they have done to serve families during this public health crisis. So we get a lot of questions about, do we need to submit an April or a May National School Lunch Program claim? Because school hasn't been in session and all of your meals have been under the unanticipated school closure program and not under the National School Lunch Program. So in April, 
you don't need to do anything for an April claim. You could submit a zero if you really, really wanted to, if it makes you feel better to stay in, in, um, in step with what you've normally done, you can certainly do that, but nothing is required. For May, however, we will be collecting your eligibility data for the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program claims. So we will be requiring that a May claim is submitted so that we can collect those data. It will still be a zero claim for the number of meals served, but the eligibility data will need to be entered. That is not open yet as of today, but I'm recording in May and you'll be watching this in June. So once that opens in June, we will send instructions to everyone and you will be able to make that happen. That still has 60 days requirements, so you'll have to do that by the end of July. For anyone who had an excess fund balance, so in the nonprofit food service account, you all know that you cannot carry more than three months worth of operating expenses as a fund balance. And if you were carrying more than that, then you got an excess fund balance notification from us. An excess fund balance is required to be spent by June 30th of each year, wherever possible. However, this was not a normal year by any stretch of the imagination. So as a result, we have been able to allow for a carryover of that excess fund balance until June 30th of 2021. So an additional year to, to spend your excess funds if you had not done so already. The plan of action must still be approved prior to requesting that, that extension and must still be approved prior to spending money. So to request that carryover extension, you would use our GEMS Mars system, log in through the Nutrition Gateway to get to the GEMS Mars system by June 15th, and your request should include a reason for your request, the date you anticipate implementing your plan of action, the date you expect to have your excess fund balance spent in full, and the amount of your carryover. That way we can process your request and get you moving along. And finally, I wanted to give you just a little heads up about state supplemental payments. Some folks have been asking what's going to happen next year because state supplemental payments are based on the year before, the meals that are served the year before. And since our meals are just completely out of whack, we don't really know what's going to happen, but we are looking at it. We know that the traditional way that we have calculated 31D, which is your supplemental lunch payment, or 31F, which is your supplemental breakfast payment, those traditional ways of calculating those payments is just out the window. Just absolutely no way that we can use that traditional method in a way that makes any sense to anyone. So my team and I are working through a plan. That plan may require that we go to the legislature for approval. It may not, I'm not exactly sure where it's going to take us, but we will work through all of that. Our goal, the idea in our mind, is that we, are the, that we hold you all harmless, that we do the least amount of harm to all of you for those payments that we possibly can. Until we know exactly what that looks like and we know exactly what the answer is, continue to track your costs attributable to breakfast and lunch. No matter what program you are serving under, track your costs for breakfast and track your costs for lunch because that may be the solution that we come up with. Again, I just don't know, but I wanted you to be aware of that as soon as possible so that you could be thinking about that as we move into the next year. So, what does next year even look like? What does our school year 2020-21 even look like? I wanted to let you know that the NSLP School Breakfast SBP NSLP Megs Plus application will be open around the first part of June. 
that notification will go out via email in the School Nutrition News, and you will be able to get in and fill out those applications. We are currently planning on everyone starting the National School Lunch Program in the fall. No matter what scenario, they may be having kids being educated under. So we know that some districts are currently planning on entirely online starting in the fall. Other districts are planning on entirely in person. And then other districts are planning on some kind of hybrid. Maybe some kids come in Monday, Tuesday, other kids come in Thursday, Friday, or some kids come in for one week and other kids come in for the next week, or maybe even some districts haven't started thinking about this. That's okay. No matter what the scenario is, everyone will move to the National School Lunch Program. My team and I will take care of whatever waivers are needed to be able to handle all of those different kinds of scenarios. So that's how we're gonna spend our summer, besides doing all those summer food service program reviews that I told you about. We're gonna work on those waivers and we will get that information out via a town hall as soon as possible. We will also be looking at waivers for whether or not school was planned to be in session in person or school was planned to be in session but not in person or school all of a sudden gets closed unexpectedly again. Maybe there's an outbreak and you have to close one building or an outbreak and you have to close a wing of a building. Whatever waivers are needed, that's exactly what we're working through. We have a small subgroup of food service directors uh, from all over the state working on a work group that we are putting together guidance for everyone as to how to handle the meal programs in the fall. And we will get that guidance out to you as, as quickly as we possibly can. And then along with that, we will have to look at whatever technology updates need to happen on our side to make it as smooth as possible for all of you. Our goal in the Office of Health and Nutrition Services is always to make it as seamless and as painless as we possibly can. We are required to follow those federal regulations just like everyone else, but if we can make it easier on you, or if you know of a way that we can make it easier on you, please let us know and we will work on that. So with that, I wanna thank you for joining me today. Thank you for listening to this session. If you have any questions, my email is on the screen and I promise that as soon as I can get to your email, I will either answer it myself or I will get you to someone who can get you an answer. But we are here to serve you and I thank you for all that you have done to help your food service team make this happen for the kids around our state. There's a lot to be proud of. We've done some amazing work and a lot of it has happened because of all of you. So thank you very much for all that you have done. Please take care and stay safe.